Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our penultimate talk of the year. I'm very excited today, and I don't have a script, so, so pardon me for that. Um, we have with us today Professor Sir Martin Foljakov, um, who, as you all probably already know, is famous for the periodic videos. And if you don't know, shame on you. Um, so, so, um, I wouldn't say too much, uh, so without further ado, uh, Sir Martin. Thank you, Leon. Um, can you all hear me with the microphone at the back? Yeah? If I talk too loud, wave your hands. Um, so, can I ask a quick question? How many of you here are chemists? Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, those of you who are not chemists, don't worry, they will probably understand it. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is the title of my talk. Um, and it's a co-presentation by me and my colleague, Mike George, who at this moment is somewhere in the air between here and Hong Kong, coming back. And um, so let me just say a few words about me, since um, conveniently Leon didn't say anything about me. Um, <laughs> so I'm a so-called research professor in chemistry, which is a title I made up for myself, so it doesn't mean anything. And I worked in the area of green chemistry, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. I'm also the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, so I work together with Alex Halliday, who you had last week, who told you about the origin of the moon. The Leon was not able to tell me what the origin of the moon was, so I was very disappointed. You must have been asleep. And so I was born in London, my father was Russian, and if you're good at maths, you can work out my age. And I've been in Nottingham a long time, and before that, I worked in Newcastle upon Tyne. And I was an undergraduate and PhD student in Cambridge, and I was at King's College, the one that has the chapel and the crown and carriage service and so on. And I'm very grateful for them because I did really badly in my finals, my undergraduate. Um, and so I got a 2-2 and I didn't qualify for a PhD grant, so the college paid for me to do a PhD. And I should say to any of you who are thinking of doing a PhD, one of the key things is to choose a <coughs> good PhD supervisor. And this is my supervisor, Jim Turner. And he and I worked together for 30 odd years until he retired, and we still keep up together. I took him with my wife to the cinema yesterday, so um, unfortunately it wasn't a very good film, so I did not go into that. Um, I also said I'm quite proud because um, this is a picture of the equipment I built for my PhD, well, the technicians built for my PhD, and this was in 1970, so in my first year of my PhD. And here is the second piece of equipment, slightly changed, which is still running in my colleague Mike George's lab, whatever it is, 45 years later. So if you think that the parents of the PhD students might not have been born when I started using this, and so I, I hope it will still keep going somewhat longer. So I've got a rather strange title about old and new solvents, so I should explain what old and new solvents mean. Oh, I'm sorry, the quote. Um, I <coughs> work in green chemistry. And green chemistry, which I don't think is taught in Oxford, um, is cleaner approaches to making chemicals and materials. So the idea is that you do something in the lab which all think, well, you can scale up to an industrial scale to make chemicals more cleanly. And we can discuss some of the reasons about why I think that's important at the end of the lecture if you want to. And my particular area is <coughs> finding cleaner solvents for carrying out chemical processes. And as I was saying, the um, title talks about old and new solvents so by oak solvents, I mean things like water, ethanol, ethyl acetate, t-shirt. 
and new solvents, for which I'm going to say nothing about them, are fluorous solvents, which are fluorinated hydrocarbons, and so-called ionic liquids, which are organic compounds, which, although they're salts, are liquid at room temperature, or close to room temperature. And um, if you want to know about those, you'll have to invite somebody else. I can give you some names for the next year's program, if you want. And my particular area are so-called supercritical fluids, which are sort of in between old and new. And the supercritical fluid is a highly compressed gas, usually, in my case, either carbon dioxide or steam, and they're compressed till they're nearly as dense as a liquid, and you can use them as solvents for doing chemical reactions. And as you know, most of you will be happy to drink water, and most of you drink CO2 in water as well. So they are environmentally quite acceptable solvents. Now, um, I just want to show you a little video to explain what a supercritical fluid is. So if you imagine you have a closed cell with a um, liquid sealed in with its vapor in the gas phase above it. So let me just show you what happens when you heat it. So as you can imagine, when you heat it, it begins to boil. And as it boils, material goes from the liquid phase to the gas phase. The gas gets denser because it can't get out, and the liquid expands because you're heating it. So this gets less steps, that gets denser, and the light between disappears. And then when you cool it down, so you've got a gas half the density of the liquid, and when you cool it down, you get this sort of snow uh, storm effect, which I think is really beautiful. I've seen this thousands of times, and I still get excited. And I keep the apparatus to demonstrate this in my office partly because there's nowhere else to keep it, and partly because I use it when interviewing people. And I show them this, and if they look at it and go, wow, I know they're suitable for me. If they get bored, I suggest they go and work with Professor X or Y. And that seems to work. I get the sort of people I want. Um, so, um, quite a long time ago now, the nearly 20 years ago, we started working with supercritical fluids for organic processing. And for, um, we did, <coughs> this is in terms of chemical engineering, not very sophisticated. And I know there isn't a chemical engineering department at Oxford, but you still should be able to understand it. And um, there is, what you do is you take the reactant and hydrogen I'm sorry, for those of you who are medics and so on, hydrogenation is reaction with hydrogen. Um, <laughs> and you uh, mix these together in supercritical CO2. Originally, we really had a mechanical stir, and now we usually use just a tube of sand. And you pass it over a tube that contains a catalyst. So reactant turns to product, and so you have a solution of the reactant coming out here, you release the pressure here, carbon dioxide turns back to a gas, and pure product comes out there. And so this is my colleague Pete License, who, when this photo was taken, was a postdoc at Nottingham. He's now a professor there. <coughs> um, and the reactor is a small tube here, the mixture is there, the things go down, and <coughs> you turn the tap, and that at the end comes to product. Um, I used to say that in getting it out was as simple as milking a cow. And then I gave a talk in Moscow, and the audience started whispering, and I got quite um, worried. You know, and so I asked, what are you talking about? And they said, we're all discussing whether or not you've milked a cow. <laughs> so, is there anybody here who's milked a cow? Like, like Cambridge, there were two people with me. It's a better quality of student there. Um, and, um, so it's actually it's easier than milking a cow. And in collaboration with an, an industrial partner, we scaled this up to a full-size plant, doing reaction on thousand tons a year scale. 
And this was published in the German Green Chemistry in 2003. And you can see here's the reactor, which is considerably bigger than the worker up here. And this plant was a huge technical success in the sense that really, as I show you, pure product came out and you could sell it just as it was. But the problem was that compressing carbon dioxide uses a lot of energy. And energy prices suddenly rushed up, and the plant was not economic to operate. So it's now mothballed. But you can see, in hindsight, why this was a problem. If you look at the so-called 12 principles of green chemistry, this is a sort of checklist that you can check your um, process against to see whether it's good or not. And so that you see there are 12 principles, and if you are good at crosswords, you will see that the first letter starts to work productively. And the principle that catches one out <coughs> is this one here, which says that things should be done, if possible, at ambient temperature and pressure, because high pressure equipment is more expensive and the energy cost. So what we're doing now, and I will talk to you, is looking at smaller scale processes making higher value added products. So the first thing I want to talk to you briefly about are automated reactors. So what happened is that um, we have essentially the same reactor as before, but here, after the reactor, we have a little loop which will take out samples automatically and inject them into a gas chromatograph for analysis. And then the analysis is fed into a computer, and the computer also can control the flow rate, uh, the temperature pressure, and so on. And they can be programmed. So what this means is that instead of you, the student, or postdoc, sitting by the apparatus, taking out a sample, analyzing it, changing the reaction conditions, analyzing the next one, you, the student or postdoc, can lie in bed. And the machine will do it for you, and then the program will increase the temperature or whatever. And I have to admit, even as supervisor, there is nothing more boring than turning up the temperature of a reaction by one or two degrees at a time. So now what happens, you can run this, and in the morning there is an Excel spreadsheet with the results nicely tabulated for you to think about. And we have then taken the concept further. This is not an original idea, but the way we've implemented it is original. The so-called self-optimizing reactors. So you have the reactants going into a reactor, which has various parameters, um, flow rate, temperature, and so on, that can be changed. But the analysis is fed back to the computer and the computer has an algorithm and can calculate a new set of parameters which it predicts should give you a better yield of product. And it goes on and on doing this so that you wind up with the best possible yield for that catalyst without having to do anything. And this really does remove an awful lot of the tedium from the work. So this it is difficult to do a four-dimensional plot on a two-dimensional screen, but you can see that you have a three-dimensional um, cube, and the yield of the product is indicated by blue is bad, like here, and red, which is, should be up here, your projection isn't very good, um, is, or perhaps my slide is bad, um, is better. So you can see that what happens is it changes flow rates, temperatures, and goes up, in this case, to 72% yield of product. And the rate at which it optimizes is really dependent on the rate at which the um, <coughs> analytical process takes place, and gas chromatographs are not very fast. They take half an hour or so to do the analysis. So this took about two days to do. My students calculated that it would have taken three months to do the same thing by hand. And so the great thing is that you can 
get the re <coughs> reaction optimized without having to worry about what the reception of mechanical defect. And so I'm quite excited about this result. I should say most of the results I'm going to tell you about are not published. So you can criticize them and we might be able to change them in the publication if you can see a flaw in them. So this is some work that's been done by um, and my student Emilia Strang and Ryan Skilton, who's finished his PhD in postdoc at Amara. And it is a react, slightly strange reaction, and I won't go through the logic where we tried it between aniline, THF, and dimethyl carbonate. For those of you medics, this is not the sort of sensible reaction that any chemist would necessarily try to do. But if you optimize it, you get two unexpected products. This one, which it turns out has been reported before, it was reported in an obscure Russian journal in 1937, and a couple of times since in very obscure places. But what's really exciting for me, Martin, the student who failed his organic finals, that we made a completely new organic compound, not in an enormously good yield, but by a reaction that people had not expected to occur. So you've got these three things reacting together to make this compound. And so I think it's really quite exciting that you can have a machine that will discover a new reaction for you without you having to worry about the details. And that's the way I think organic chemistry should be done. Um, and this has just been submitted last week to the journal Angavanti Chemie and hasn't yet been rejected. Um, so if you want to see, there's a video about um, our automated reactor. This is slightly on the slide. Quite a lot more people have watched it since. And if you want to see our channel, this is the website, periodicvideos.com. There are 545 um, videos that you can watch. The latest one is what happens if you put chicken's legs, or dead chickens, into, <laughs> into, into concentrated acids. And the result in HF is quite surprising. So, now, let me get on to the meat of what I want to I'm going to tell you about three examples with these old solvents. And really, what is going to um, link these together is the use of water as a solvent for reactions. And the first one is hydrogenation, that's I mean, hydrogen again, to levulinic acid, which most of you won't know what it is and then making metacrylic acid from biomass, and finally, semi-synthetic artemisinin. So let's begin with levulinic acid. This is levulinic acid, which is a product that you can make quite easily from hexose sugars, which you can get from starch and similar um, materials from biomass. And levulinic acid can be made in huge quantities from biomass, and is has been touted as a new platform chemical from which you can make all sorts of other chemicals. And this is work, this, this, this first thing is quite old, it's now seven, nearly eight years old. It was work done by Rich Bourne, who was a postdoc in my group, and Jamie Stevens. Rich is now a sort of academic in Leeds, that is, he doesn't yet have a permanent job, but perhaps he will get one soon. Uh, and so levulinic acid can be hydrogenated to make this molecule called uh, gamma valerolactone. You add hydrogen and you lose water. And GBL has been suggested as a sustainable additive, fuel additive. And Istvan Horbach, who is a Hungarian green chemist working in Hong Kong, is really passionate about GBL. He has a patent for using GBL as a barbecue lighter. <laughs> you know, you pour it on your barbecue and the barbecue lights, whereas if you put petrol on the bar barbecue, you light yourself. <laughs> barbecue. And the problem with this reaction is that if you, you have to remove the water by distillation, <coughs> and the boiling point of GBL is much higher than the boiling point of water, 
So you're distilling water out of the GBL. And distillation of water is a very energy intensive process because water has a very high um, <coughs> latent heat of vaporization. So uh, <coughs> we wondered whether you could hydrogenate lipidinic acid in supercritical CO2. And GBL, the product, is a liquid but lipidinic acid is a solid, so you need some sort of co-solvent to dissolve it up in so you can pump it. And there's a patent which it says recent here, yeah, but it was in 2004, so it's not so recent now. Patent from DuPont which uses 1,4-dioxane um, as a solvent. And I think you will agree that 1,4-dioxane is not terribly green, or at least I doubt if many of you would want to drink it. Um, but this is tea, not they also. <laughs> so, I had an idea. I should say that students are enormously resistant to professors having ideas, because they're usually wrong. Um, the professors, not the students. Um, so I had the idea that perhaps we could mix levulinic acid with water. And um, this because water is dense and lipidinic acid and has light, higher and a lighter molecular weight. This is two moles of water to one mole of lipidinic acid. And if you mix these two together, surprisingly, you end up with a nice, easily pumpable liquid. So water is a byproduct of the reaction anyway, and it's greener than toluene or dioxane. So the question is whether does the hydrogenation would work you add in water. And so it does work. You pump in lipidinic acid in water, CO2 and hydrogen over a ruthenium catalyst, you get a very good yield of GBL, and if you have enough hydrogen, a small amount of excess lipidinic acid, and this way the CO2 and hydrogen goes. So my students, however, looked at this and suggested that I was dim because the reaction produces water anyway. And here you've added more water, so you have a bigger problem distilling out the water from the GBL than you would have done normally. So there was much muttering of told you so, and that it was a stupid idea. So I then went to a conference in India, and at the conference, Somebody showed a couple of slides of work by a guy called Chuck Eckert, who's the father of supercritical studies, um, who works at um, <coughs> Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia. And he did, got all his students, did an experiment where they took a high-pressure transparent tube and took a mixture of THF and water, tetrahydrofuran and water, and a dye which is soluble in water but not in THF. And then they pressurized it with CO2, and the THF is a mixture of THF and CO2 separated completely from the dye and water. So I, sitting there in the lecture theater in India with no Wi Fi, suddenly had an idea. So I rushed back to the students and said, Look, THF has a structure that's quite similar to GBL, the ring with oxygen, and since water and THF uh, emissible under uh, high pressure of CO2, perhaps GBL is the same. And of course the students said to me, don't be silly, this molecule doesn't look anything like that one. It has a methyl group there, a carbonyl group, it's, it's completely different. But eventually it was easier for them to do the experiments than to argue with me anymore. So this is their experiment. The red dye is the very unromantic name of direct red 23. So this is GBL and water and the dye in the cell at one atmosphere pressure. And if you pressurize it with CO2, you find that GBL and CO2 separate and the water and the dye go to the bottom and there's a bit of CO2 at the top. And the students got a bit overexcited with the um, stirrer so that some of it's flushed on the window. Now, the implication of this is that the pressure here, 93 um, bar, a bar is slightly less than atmosphere's pressure. 
for those of you who like SI units, this is uh, 9.3 megapascals. What this means is that inside our reactor, the water and the GVL must be separated. And it's only when we release the pressure that they the water and the GVL mixed. So with a bit of clever plumbing, you can actually plant, get the pure GVL to come out and the water and the excess limonene acid go that way. So that you get complete separation without any need to do distillation at all. And this was published in German Chemcom and it's the work of Jamie and Rich and also my colleague Kurgia who's still in Nottingham. And so the exciting thing is that the separation doesn't require any extra energy and the energy you need to compress the CO2 is the less than the energy that you need to distill the water. So we agree and was very pleased with this. <coughs> so now I want to change that completely and talk about methacrylic acid from biomass. Now methacrylic acid is a huge commodity chemical, I mean huge volume, and is the precursor to methacrylic and methyl methacrylate, which is the monomer for perspex. Very conveniently, though it won't show on the film, this is perspex, if you have forgotten the plastic here. <laughs> so, um, and so in America it's called plexiglass. And the traditional way of making it is from acetone reacting it with hydrogen cyanide. So you don't need to be a great green chemist to realize that using 100,000 tons a year of hydrogen cyanide is not the greenest process that you can imagine in terms of safety. Is there anybody here from Middlesbrough? All the southerners. So, so there's, this process has operated in um, Middlesbrough by, by what was ICI on a 100,000 tonne scale, so it's really quite serious. And there is a new process which is commercialized by the company Lucite, in which you can take a mixture of CO, ethylene and methanol in a palladium catalyst and then add formaldehyde and make meth methyl methacrylate without needing to use hydrogen cyanide. But you still need to make formaldehyde and um, <coughs> ethylene, or at least it's normally made, from um, oil. So Lucite <coughs> was interested to see whether you could make methacrylic acid, and hence methyl methacrylate, from biomass. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and the problem is that there isn't a nice biotechnology route to making methacrylic acid. There aren't, at the moment, any fungus or yeast or bacteria that will take the some starting material made into methacrylic acid, largely because methacrylic acid is poisonous and kills the bugs. So the idea is that you have a semi-synthetic route. So you take biomass, and turn it to some intermediate compound, and then take that intermediate compound and turn it into methacrylic acid using chemistry. And the, the <coughs> work I'm going to describe is based on some work by Antal and his group at the University of Hawaii. Now there is a place which might be nice to do chemistry in which he did an extremely complicated scheme, which <coughs> you will see at the back, for <coughs> making methacrylic acid down here from various acids by heating them in high temperature water. And this scheme can be somewhat simplified, and um, this is work of Tom Huddle, who was a PhD student, and Laura <coughs> Schofield, who's in the final stages of writing her thesis. She's written two chapters and it has to be finished by the end of the month. And, because she's got a job. And um, so what they've done is to take a number of acids, particularly <coughs> this one here, itaconic acid, which can be made quite easily by fermentation 
and you heat it up in the presence of sodium hydroxide and you make methacrylic acid and carbon dioxide. So you're decarboxylating it. And because it's in high temperature water, you get some of this as well, so called HIV, which is an equilibrium. And things can go wrong and you can make pyruvic acid as well. And <clears throat> just to show you, it's quite simple, that if you pump itaconic acid and sodium hydroxide at high temperature water under pressure, as you increase the temperature, you get a better and better yield of methacrylic acid. So if you think about it, you can devise quite a nice little process. You have sodium hydroxide and itaconic acid, which you have to use in um, <coughs> acrimolar amounts. So you have sodium itaconate, you heat it up, CO2 comes off, so you get sodium meth methacrylate, and you can't get an ionic salt out of solution, so you have to add a strong acid, so sulfuric acid, and so you get sodium sulfate, methacrylic acid, which you can extract with an organic salt, so toluene. So this looks really good, but there's a flaw because you're left with sodium sulfate. So you have a process which is actually a rather complicated process for making sodium sulfate, of which methacrylic acid is a byproduct. And obviously there's going to be a lot more waste of that than that in terms of tons. So it was really unpromising. And then we had a breakthrough. We looked at the pKa's of the acid. So methacrylic acid is a rather weak acid compared to sulfuric acid, which has, this is the pKa. Perhaps those of you <coughs> first or second year students didn't realize that pKa could ever be useful except for answering exam questions, but here you can see it is. We suddenly realized that the starting material, itaconic acid, is a stronger acid than methacrylic acid. So you can have a much nicer process in which you start by the same way as before. You have sodium itaconate, heat it up, CO2 comes off, you make sodium methacrylate, but then you add more itaconic acid, so you get sodium itaconate, and you can extract the methacrylic acid. And then you can just recycle this at the beginning. In fact, at the end, you don't even need any more sodium, so it should just go round and round. You add in itaconic acid, and out comes methacrylic acid. So that's the theory. So this is an experiment that Laura did for five cycles. And this is the amount of methacrylic acid in the water when it's recycled, and this is the amount you extract out. And you can see after the first cycle or the second cycle, you get a bit more because you've already saturated the water, and then it appears to be nice and constant. However, one learns in science that everything is not quite as good as it looks. So if she did 20 cycles, that's quite a serious thing. And disappointingly, the yield went down and down and down. But then, she remembered that the reaction is quite pH sensitive. You have to have just the right amount of sodium hydroxide or the reaction doesn't go so well. So she decided that each time she would add a tiny bit of sodium hydroxide or um, sulfuric acid to get the pH to the right value. And then when she did it again, the orange shows where it went down the yield was not quite so beautiful, but you can see it stayed almost the same. So it's really quite promising that you've got high temperature water process, which is now catalyzed by sodium hydroxide because you can recycle it, and you can reduce the waste to a tiny fraction of what there was before. Now, the problem is <coughs> when you make chemicals in the lab, you don't have to sell them. Well, you have to sell them to, if you're an undergraduate to be demonstrating and say, look, I make a nice sample. 
but you're not selling them to customers. Whereas if you're making a monomer for a plastic, you have to worry about things that you don't have to worry in the lab, like the color of the plastic you produce. People will not be happy if their nice sign comes out yellow instead of colors. So this shows some traditional uh, perspex made with traditional metacrylic acid, and this shows some perspex made with metacrylic acid <coughs> made by this bio process. <coughs> and Laura got very excited, so she put a male chemist showing the dirty process and a woman chemist with two green glass showing that this process is really quite promising. So it's now got to the stage that we've done all the basic chemistry that's necessary, and it is up to company to decide whether this is something process they want to take further, or were they going to make methacrylic acid from shale gas, whatever. But we now have the basis of a considerably cleaner process. So now this brings me to the last thing, which is semi-synthetic artemisinin. Now, artemisinin is an anti-malarial drug, one of the more successful ones. This is artemisinin. <coughs> and it is made from a, um, or the major way of making it is to extract it from a plant called Artemisia annua, which grows particularly in Vietnam and in China. So you plant the stuff, harvest it, do an extraction and get out the artemisinin, which is not a major component of the plant, and it takes months, because even in a country like Vietnam, you can only do perhaps two, or if you're really lucky, three crops a year. And this doesn't necessarily supply <coughs> all the demand for <coughs> artemisinin. You probably know that malaria is a really dreadful disease, and approximately one child dies every minute from malaria. So already 40 children have died in the course of this lecture from malaria, which is dreadful. And so <clears throat> there's some very clever chemistry, another semi-synthetic pathway, in which work done in the States on genetically modified yeast has shown that you can take sugar and do a fermentation to make this product here, artemisinic acid, which can then be taken chemically to make artemisinin. And this process from sugar that takes weeks as opposed to months. And <coughs> the key step of this process is photochemical adding oxygen to the substrate. And this is the um, pilot plant of Sanofi where they're photochemical reactor. Um, and I'm not quite sure why it's not straight. I think it may be that the chemists can't hold the camera straight rather than the chemical engineering. And this is what it looks like on scale. And for those of you who are interested, this is the reaction where the key step is adding O2 photochemically by, with a photosensitizer, the so-called chain E reaction. Um, so you go from there to make this hydroperoxide, and then there's an acid catalyzed step to make artemisinin. And this, these three oxygen atoms in a five member ring is really what appears to zap the, um, they're not bats, but the <coughs> parasites and kill them. Um, and the um, German chemist Zeber, the name is up here, and his group have developed quite a neat synthetic process, a uh, flow process, <coughs> continuous flow process for doing this reaction, where using toluene solvent, and the, but you still have quite a lot of work up the reaction, and they get about 46% yield isolated the product. So they're using photochemistry and so-called singlet oxygen. For those of you who are chemists, you remember from your first year chemistry, perhaps not first year, but 
that oxygen has unpaired electrons. If you use a photosensitizer, you can pair the electrons in oxygen briefly for a fraction of a second, making it far more reactive. And then, but unfortunately, the commercial process uses dichloromethane, which is now not considered a good solvent to use in the pharmaceutical industry, and they use trichloroacetic acid as the acid, and trichloroacetic acid is very toxic. And they use a lot of solvents for purifying the blood. So, um, we first of all tried to do the reaction in CO2, for the reason which is, I think, fairly obvious, that CO2 doesn't burn. So doing a reaction with oxygen in supercritical CO2 is likely to be inherently much safer than doing, it in, say, toluene. And so we did use the experiment with visible light and then acid, and we got quite a high percent yield. This work of Jess Ben Bellamy, Zach Amara, and Ralph Forber. Zach and Amara, uh, Zach and Ralph are both postdocs, and Jess um, finished her PhD a year ago. And has now transformed herself into a software engineer. And, um, but we decided to do control experiments, and for reasons which are complicated and I don't need to explain now, we decided to look at the reaction of singlet oxygen in a mixture of ethanol and water. Now, for those of you who are serious organic chemists, you will know that singlet oxygen is rarely used in water because the singlet oxygen is quenched, that is, the electrons pair very rapidly in water. And here you can see the decay. But surprisingly, if you look at all these kinetics, and it's late, so we won't go into kinetics. What it shows is that, the, that you can get a reaction in solvent containing water. And this turned out, for our point of view, to be really exciting. Because um, we could now do continuous reactions, and here's a picture of one of our continuous reactors. Um, <coughs> and this is also the work of Sam Miller, who's a current PhD student, where you pump stuff in through a tube which has LED um, lamps, which are very powerful <coughs> and very efficient. These are similar to the LEDs in the headlights of Audi cars. And very fortunately, you can buy the headlights without the cars. So um, you can have, this is the equivalent of several Audi cars at once. And so the reaction ethanol water. And this reaction worked really well. And, but what was very exciting is that when you evaporated off some of the ethanol, artemisinin is not soluble in dilute solutions of ethanol in water. We have proved experimentally that artemisinin will not dissolve in vodka. And so what happens is it precipitates a fuel, and so you can just filter it off and even take one of these crystals into a crystal structure. When I was doing my PhD a long time ago, it took the best part of a year for a student to do a crystal structure. Now, the structure of artemisinin is already known, but when we asked our colleagues to do the crystal structure, one of these crystals, from getting into the room with a crystal to getting that structure on the computer screen, took an hour and a half. It was amazing. It was like magic. And um, so, but the thing is that in the conventional way of making um, artemisinin, there are a whole series of stages of purification, changing the solvent and so on. And here you can just filter it out pure. So <clears throat> what we're doing, in effect, is changing the solvent properties of the solvent by changing the ratio of ethanol to water. And this stands revolutionary. In fact, for those of you who work in organic labs or have seen it, this is an HPLC machine, 
high pressure liquid chromatography or high performance, depending what you think the P is for. And in an HPLC machine, you often change the strength of the solvent by pumping two different solvents in different ratios. But what we can do here is to have a really nice process where we put in the starting material of oxygen, we radiate with light, distill off a bit of the ethanol, filter off the product, and then everything else can be recycled and go round and round. So you have a beautifully clean process. And the output is pure product. And you can recycle ethanol, water, sulfuric acid, which is the acid we use, which is much less toxic than um, trifluoroacetic acid and the photocatalyst. Now, obviously, you can't do this forever because byproducts and things will eventually build up, but you can do it for quite a number of cycles. And this has been very exciting. This has just been accepted for publication in Nature Chemistry. So, let me just summarize. What I hope I've shown you is that water is quite a sol versatile solvent, and you can use mixed solvents, for example, ethanol and water, are actually tunable. If you invite people to talk about, say, ionic liquids, they will tell you, we can design solvents that have this property or that property. I'm saying that you don't do badly just with a mixture of ethanol and water, and it's a lot cheaper. And so this, once you realize that, you have new process opportunities. And you have greener processes, or they could be greener. So I want to end with a quick advertisement for the journal Green Chemistry, which is the Royal Society of Chemistry Journal. And for quite a few years, I was the chair of the editorial board. Those of you who are more senior um, undergraduates and postgraduates will know that this has so-called impact factor, which is really quite high. Chemists and scientists generally have become obsessed, in my view, completely wrongly with the impact factor of the journal. You really need to read the paper to see whether it's any good, not just look at the factor of the journal, but this is quite good. And this particular cover is actually the um, 13 Principles of Green Chemistry for Africa, which I and my colleagues developed for a special Green Chemistry Conference in Africa. And you can ask me afterwards why they have an extra principle in Africa compared to other chemists. So I need to thank, I've already mentioned all of my um, group who've done the experiments that I talked about. I'd particularly like to thank Kai Rosson, who is our collaborator in Sanofi, who's been really great help in developing the work. And also, <coughs> Graham Easton, Mark Woff, and David Johnson at Lucite, and of course, all my other students and postdocs and collaborators. And I'd like to thank the people who funded our work, particularly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that funded our work on artemisinin. But I would particularly like to thank my, uh, our technicians, Pete Fields, Rich Wilson, and Mark Geiler. Now, you might not realize that it is very easy for universities to get new professors. People will almost pay to come as a professor to Oxford. But on the other hand, it is really hard for universities to replace good technicians, because technicians don't come from America to be a technician in Oxford or whatever. And our work relies very heavily on the quality and the work of our technicians who make some of the equipment that we need, which we can't buy. And so I would particularly like to let, thank these three, because all my success in my work really relies on their efforts. And finally, I would just like to thank you. I'll show you my research group and thank them for their help and support. Uh, there are not all there, but there are two things which I think 
from a cement place and mention it, mainly the obvious that it is very multinational. But what I hope will strike you is that it has a large preponderance of women, which I think is very good because we are promoting the role of women in what is not only chemistry but quite serious engineering as well. Thank you. accessible is um, or are those high pressure um, flow devices kind of you have, your lab is very specialized but for example for a company developing a new process how easy is it to get those um, well I, I mean the, the reactors themselves are quite unusual uh, but they're all made from um, standard high pressure parts in fact many of our reactors are made from second hand pumps that we have bought, not through the internet, we're not allowed to buy through the internet, but from dealers in second hand equipment. So the answer is there's a lot of know-how, but the equipment itself is very accessible. And supercritical CO2 is used quite widely for extraction, particularly for decaffeination of coffee. So you can buy, buying supercritical equipment is pretty mainstream. Um, and we have just come up with an idea which we call cloud chemistry for people who would like to try experiments but don't have the equipment where in principle they can control the equipment we have at Nottingham through the internet and as a proof of principle we've got had chemists working in Beijing, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia <coughs> Porto Alegre in, in um, Brazil and in Ismia in Turkey demonstrating that they can run experiments in Nottingham. And there's a paper that it's in um, Nature Chemistry, page one this year. I've always dreamt of getting a paper on page one, and this is the first time in my career, because I have a theory that, can, that scientists never read enough literature, and every year they make a New Year's resolution this year is going to be different. So if you're on page one of the journal, you have a chance of getting ready. <coughs> so, more questions? Yeah, if you're using supercritical CO2, does it work with other gases as well? Um, so, the, I don't know if you've heard it, but the question is, can you have other gases supercritical? The answer is that anything can be supercritical. Um, and, the, um, the only limitation is that some materials will um, decompose before they get to their critical point. But, um, the, for example, polythene, the sort of cheapest grades of polythene, are made in supercritical ethylene. And, there is, and most modern power stations use supercritical steam. And, but you can, anything can be supercritical, even you can have supercritical HF if you're brave enough. <laughs> I can't remember, I think the critical temperature of HF is around about 145 degrees, but, but having 40 odd atmospheres of HF requires a certain degree of courage, which I don't have. But there is, there is a chemist called Boris Chemba, or was, I don't know if he's still, active in, um, <laughs> in Slovenia, we used to do experiments in supercritical HF. So, more questions? Yeah, so, oh, the woman in, yeah, <laughs> yes. So, you mentioned how um, normally water would qu quench the um, single oxygen, yeah. but in this case it doesn't. Um, how does that work, and can you do any other reactions that can't traditionally be done in water that way? Well, I think the answer is that um, there are a few reports of people doing reactions in water, but it's just got a sort of, not quite a myth, but people have just as thought, well, you can't do it in water. It's probably you can do lots of reactions in water. 
And, but we tried doing one or two other reactions so far, and they seem to work. And um, the, but I think um, it relies on having quite a concentrated solution because effectively you have a singlet oxygen which has a certain lifetime, which can be quite short, and it is got to hit your reactant before the electrons switch their spins again. So there was a question so I don't know. Um, what would happen if you put a chicken leg into the crystal <laughs> um, Well, the first thing it would cook, because, <laughs> because of the temperature. Um, and I don't know, the, the surprising thing about putting the chicken leg in ordinary HF at room temperature is um, that the meat <coughs> goes completely white, so it ends up this colour, because the HF seems to attack the porphyrins in the myoglobin that gives the meat the pink colour <coughs> very quickly. And, um, even the part of the chicken leg that was not in the HF looked decidedly dead. It's sort of a sort of sickly greenish colour. Whereas the sulfuric acid chicken and the stuff in the sulfuric acid looked somewhat yuck, but the, the bit sticking out you feel you could almost have eaten. Well, having been cooked. So, more questions. How about can green chemistry? Um, I don't think, well, I don't think, um, well, using CO2 <coughs> as a solvent uh, won't offset it because eventually you have to liberate the CO2, but you are using the CO2 that somebody else has produced. Um, green chemistry is, um, in the, those parts of green chemistry that are making chemicals from biomass should, in principle, be tying up um, by uh, carbon. You could argue that if you make plastic bottles from biomass, um, this one is just a conventional um, <coughs> polyethylene terephthalate, but you can make plastic bottles from biomass. Then, in effect, because these decompose so slowly that when you put this in landfill, you are taking CO2 from the atmosphere and putting it in the landfill. But realistically, <coughs> even at the rate we drink bottled water, and I hasten to add this is a reused bottle, um, it would not um, it would not have much effect on CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, which primarily come from power generation and transport use. More questions? Yeah. Where do you see the next big breakthrough green chemistry coming from, or where would you like to see it from? Um, well, I can answer them two ways. Scientifically, I have absolutely no idea. But I think that the breakthroughs will come from young people like you because um, the problem is that um, when I started my PhD, I was working on a photochemistry of organometallic compounds at 20 degrees Kelvin. And I was really proud that my work was totally useless. <laughs> and, um, but I think now things have changed. And the population of the world is more than double what it was when I did my PhD, nearly three times what it is. There are clear signs that resources on the planet are becoming stressed, if not actually running out. And so there is a really urgent need for chemists to start working trying to solve these problems. And the um, Royal Society published a report two and a half years ago about called People on the Planet, which pointed out that the world now has a population of 7 billion, and of those 7 billion, 1.3 billion are profoundly poor. 
the definition of something being profoundly poor, then I'm sure there's a technical one. But my favorite one is that somebody who, if you ask them, can list everything that they own. If I ask your parents how many teaspoons they own, unless they're particularly mean, um, and they won't know. Uh, so <clears throat> we are now have this very serious ethical problem that there are 1.3 billion people in the world who should be consuming more. And so, and they need to consume more, not at the cost of everybody else consuming less. I mean, obviously people have to consume somewhat less, but the rich are not going to give up everything, just where one has to be realistic. So what, becoming from Nottingham, I pose this in terms of what I call the Robin Hood question, which is, how can we give to the poor without robbing the rich? And chemically what this means is that from a given amount of starting material, we have to make more product. And that is going to require a lot of new chemistry and process engineering as well, but all sorts of reactions and things which at the moment we don't have. And the ideas from those are going to come from young chemists who are at your stage or perhaps still at school. And so I think there's a real need to get people working on these problems. And that's where the exciting breakthroughs will come. You should be inspired by the um, chemist Perkin, who became a professor here, who um, discovered the first synthetic dye at the age of 18, the dye Mobile. He started a company with his father, and he was a millionaire, which in the 19th century was something, not like um, every house owner in London. And so he. Um, he was a millionaire by the time he was 30 and retired and became an academic and did academic chemistry. Now that's a really good role model for me. Yeah? How quickly have companies been to take on your work and prove their methods? Uh, I think one could put it two ways. The people who have taken on my, I mean, a lot of my work has been done with um, industry. It takes a long time to, for a new chemical process to be turned into commercial reality. For so-called fine chemicals, those are things that are made on a scale of 500 or 1,000 tons, it can be relatively quick, a few years. If you're making a commodity chemical like terephthalic acid, terephthalic acid is benzene with two para um, acid groups, um, a typical world-class plant now makes 700,000 or a million tons a year and costs hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars. And that's quite a serious amount of money to invest. And I mean, the reactor of a current terephthalic acid plant, I think, is the size of this room, a bigger. And so those sort of investments require really quite a long need time. Green chemistry was started in the United States in, there's some argument, but around about 1990 or 91, so that's 24 years ago. So the principles of green chemistry are being adopted quite widely by um, industry, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, and a brilliant example is Viagra, where the original route for making Viagra required, or would have required, um, 1300, more than 1,300 um, litres of solvent and make a kilo of product. That's more than a tonne of solvent. And the commercial process that was eventually implemented used six and a half litres of solvent. That's still six and a half times more solvent than product, but you can see it's very much better. And the um, there are companies like GSK, which are very heavily committed to green chemistry. In fact, GSK has made a large donation to Nottingham um, to build a sustainable chemistry building, carbon neutral chemistry building, uh, which is under construction at the moment. 
it underwent a minus setback in that it was burnt to the ground when it was 70% built. Um, probably, I didn't know, through some electrical fault or something like that. Um, but it's now being rebuilt. So there is a very big commitment towards green chemistry in um, industry. My feeling is that the subject of green chemistry will eventually disappear because all chemistry will be green. But if you've worked in a traditional organic chemistry lab, they use huge quantities of solvent, whole trolley loads to do a column in one day. And in the end, at the moment, that's state of the art, the way that you do these things, but they clearly, in the longer term, has to be a much better way of doing things. Yeah. Are there any other drugs that are being Um, the, uh, <coughs> I, I did, there is a company, a um, Swiss company called Kaufmann La Roche, um, that was, I did it, still do, was using supercritical CO2 for hydrogenation of um, an intermediate to make a material called tocopherol, which is, I think, precursor to vitamin E or vitamin E itself. Um, the, the pharmaceutical industry uses supercritical fluids quite a lot for um, processing of their pharmaceutical products, that is recrystallization and things like that. But because they're producing high value products in relatively small amounts, the compression cost issues are much less than that if they're running a whole chemical farm. But um, I think in the long run, supercritical fluids, I think, are going to be quite useful in certain applications. And, but they're not the um, solution to everything. And the problems of green chemistry are so massive that one is going to need nearly every idea that has been had so far, and lots of more ideas as well. The ideas that your colleague over there in the corner in the same t shirt going to produce. Uh, all these ideas are going to be needed in order to, um, to solve the problems. Because if we don't solve the problems, the uh, future of the societies we know looks like the peak. So we have to find better and greener ways of making it chemical. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. What was that um, principle of green, extra principle of green chemistry in Africa? Oh, that you for Africa, the 13th I should explain this. There's a, there's a technical reason why there's a 13th principle of green chemistry. Because I don't, has anybody here been to Ethiopia? Uh, um, Ethiopia has an unusual calendar which has 13 months in the year. If you see a tourist, Post of Ethiopia, it will say 13 months of sunshine. So they have 12 months of 30 days and a little month with either five or six days as appropriate. And so we thought it would be good to have 13 principles. And the 13th principle is don't make the mistakes of others. Because in um, what I might describe as the more developed north, we have made all sorts of um, mistakes, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, in pollution and making chemicals very inefficiently. And now people in Africa, starting from scratch, developing with their own chemical industries, can learn from the mistakes we've made, and all being well bypass them so that they won't make the same mistakes. So that's the 13th principle. And I should say the 13 principles of um, green chemistry for Africa, the initial letters instead of spelling, productively spell greener Africa. Any other final question? 
struggle with. Yes. Yeah. Um, in your photos, I, I looked at the, well, you have photos of your reactors and stuff, and they, they all yeah. seem like fairly big metal sort of reactors. Uh, but I was just wondering whether there are potential process benefits, uh, efficiency benefits to be reaped like there's a possibility of downscaling the size well, of I, I mean, the, the point is that the reactors really have, well, I mean, the, the, the Thomas Swan plant, I showed you, the Patterson plant, is quite seriously large. Yeah. But the thing is that if you're going to start making chemicals, you need to make them on quite a large scale. If you make a ton a year, that's about three kilos a day, which is still quite a a large amount compared to what people normally make in the lab. If you want to make um, 3,000 tons a year, that's nearly 10 tons a day, which is really quite big. So um, the answer is that you need quite big equipment. And miniature equipment is really quite a pain because if you have very narrow ball tubing it's very easy for it to get blocked. One crystal can block, block the pipe. However, if you have a pipe that's that sort of diameter you need something the size of a chestnut or bigger therefore to block the pipe. But with the thousand tons a year plant the pipe that pumped the camp starting material into the plant was a narrow diameter than the um, forefinger of my postdoc. So even a thousand tons a year plant is not very big. And the major problem of a plant like the one there is that um, hydrogenation is quite an exothermic <coughs> reaction. And as you scale the reaction up, you've got to get rid of the heat. And if you don't get rid of the heat, it will just get hotter and hotter and eventually melt. Even the one on the lab scale that I showed you, if you run a full belt without cooling, the reactor temperature will go up to 400 degrees centigrade just from the heat of the reaction, which is getting towards the limit that stainless steel will hold pressure. As you heat up steel, it gets weaker and will stand less pressure. So, everybody's tired. I have to go back to Nottingham. So thank you for inviting me. And if you want to come and ask a few more questions, please feel free to do so before I go. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. That's fairly late. There'll be refreshments outside um, uh, if anyone's interested. Um, next week, we will be having Professor uh, Russell Foster to talk about the circadian cycle. So we all, we all study very hard and sleep very little. So circadian cycle is probably something if you want to hear about. Um, other than that, um, thank you, Simon, for coming on the Wednesday evening. And um, see you again. Thank you. Um, anyone is still not on the mailing list but wants to be on the mailing list, you can either sign up uh, with uh, Sophie or Sobia or Rafi. They're all there waving pieces of paper so you can just get them. Yeah.